Well, thank you, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Actually, thank you all for being here so early. I know this is definitely a non-trivial task for me, at least. So today, I'll be telling you about some new protocols for estimating properties of fermionic systems. And we'll see that these protocols also come sort of hand in hand with some more general results that might be useful in other settings as well. So this work was actually motivated by a very concrete, even urgent problem, which was an exponential scaling of an algorithm that had been recently developed by my co-authors. They called this algorithm Quantum Classical Quantum Monte Carlo, or QCQMC for short. Um, it's a hybrid quantum classical algorithm for simulating fermionic systems. And they implemented this algorithm on the Sycamore processor in what was um, the largest chemistry experiment on a quantum computer so far. So that was, that was all fun and great, but there was um, a rather glaring issue, which was that the algorithm had an exponentially scaling uh, classical step. And to understand what that step is, we have to look a tiny bit more at the algorithm. So the algorithm QCQMC is based on quantum Monte Carlo, which is actually a family of classical computational methods for the ground state problem. And generically, these quantum Monte Carlo methods rely on having an ansatz to the ground state, referred to as the trial wave function. And the accuracy of the quantum Monte Carlo calculation sort of depends on the quality of this trial wave function. So the main idea behind QCQMC was to use a quantum computer to prepare sort of richer families of trial wave functions than would be tractable classically. And a crucial step in the quantum Monte Carlo calculation is to estimate overlaps between this trial wave function and many, many so-called water states. Um, and in the original version of QCQMC, this was done using the classical shadows protocol, namely the one that's based on making random Clifford measurements. So the advantage of using classical shadows was that it substantially reduced the number of copies of the uh, trial wave function we need. It's only logarithmic in the number of walkers, which is very large. But the big drawback was that the classical post-processing was exponentially costly. So naturally, we wanted to fix this, and we did. And in this talk, I'll show you protocols for estimating um, various classes of fermionic quantities, including but not limited to these overlaps that are required for QCQMC. And um, importantly, uh, these protocols are gonna be efficient in terms of both quantum and classical resources. So our protocols are still gonna be based on the basic framework of classical shadows, but instead of using the um, Clifford measurements considered by the original shadows paper, which is what led to the exponentially costly classical post-processing, we're gonna consider different measurement ensembles that turn out to work better in our fermionic setting. And these other measurement ensembles are gonna be given by random match state circuits, which I'll tell you what they are. But first, um, let's review the classical shadows framework. So, the goal is to estimate the expectation values of multiple observables, O1 to OM, with respect to an arbitrary unknown state rho. And we're assuming that we're given copies of rho along with classical descriptions of these observables. So how do we do this? Well, the first step is to, is to choose some distribution over unitaries which we'll call D. So in Richard's talk yesterday, he considered specifically um, the uniform distribution over all circuits generated by single qubit Clifford gates. But here we're gonna work in more generality and just fit some arbitrary distribution. Um, and then we make random measurements according to this distribution. So we randomly sample a unitary from D and then measure rho in the basis given by U dagger acting on computational basis states B. We can write down the quantum channel that describes this random measurement process. We'll call this M. And for certain distributions D, this channel M will be invertible, in which case M inverse applied to the post-measurement state uh, serves as an unbiased estimator for rho. So that means that we can get the expectation values of our observables 
um, with respect to row by computing their expectation values with respect to samples of the classical shadow. We'll uh, collect some appropriate number of samples by repeating this procedure. And one thing I want to point out is that uh, measuring rho is the only step here that's actually performed on the quantum computer. Everything else here is done classically. Oh, wow, okay. Sorry, they, uh, my formatting got screwed up a bit, but at least my slides seem to be there, so. Um, okay, so that's the basic classical shadows framework. It's pretty straightforward, but of course it's not a silver bullet. So like in addition to the sort of practical drawbacks that Richard pointed out yesterday um, for his particular uh, distribution, there's also theoretical limitations or caveats in that not all protocols that you can derive from the classical shadows framework are actually going to be efficient. In particular, the efficiency of any given protocol will depend both on the observables that you want to measure and the distribution D that you choose and how these interact. Um, so there's sort of two main things. The first thing is that the number of samples that you need to take scales with the maximum over this variance for each observable. So here, var of OI um, is the variance of the estimate that we get from OI from the shadows associated with D. So this variance also depends on the distribution. So in order to not need too many copies of rho, ideally we want to be able to choose D such that the variances of all the observables are small. This may or may not be possible. And even in the cases where it is possible, you might still have the problem that there's no way to efficiently do the classical post-processing, namely to compute these expectation values of the observables with respect to the shadow samples. And that's exactly what happened with the original version of QCQMC. So the relevant observables um, to measure for getting the required overlaps in that case turn out to all have um, small variance when you use the uniform distribution over all n qubit Clifford circuits. But the issue was that the classical post processing uh, seems to require exponential time for general Clifford circuits, like for computing this quantity. Okay, so as we can see, there's multiple different things to check when we're trying to construct an efficient protocol using the classical shadows framework. And we can compile all of these into a checklist. So let's say you have some observables that you want to measure, and you have some candidate distribution D in mind. Well, the first thing to check is that you can actually efficiently implement this distribution, like efficiently sample unitaries from D and compile them into, into quantum circuits. This is, I call this step zero because um, it's sort of like you, if you're considering this distribution at all, you should have probably already done this. The first non-trivial step is to determine the measurement channel M associated with the distribution um, to find the form of the class little shadow samples. And then, uh, once, you that, once we've done that, we need to figure out how to efficiently extract estimates of the observables from our shadow samples. And finally, we should also analyze the variance, hopefully show that it's small for all of our observables. All of our observables. Okay, so the first two steps depend only on the distribution, whereas the last two depend both on the distribution and the observables of interest. So in this talk, we'll actually do all of these steps um, for the case where D is taken to be the uniform distribution over matched state circuits and for various fermionic observables. Okay, but first I should tell you what matched state circuits are. So one way to think about them is that under the jordan Wigner transformation, matched state circuits are qubit representations of fermionic Gaussian unitaries, which implement free fermion evolution. But more precisely, uh, we can define them in terms of Majorana operators. So for n qubits representing n fermionic modes, there's two n Majorana operators, gamma one to gamma two n, and they're defined by these anti-commutation relations. Uh, or if you're more familiar, you can also define them in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So now for some important notation. Um, for any subset of indices S from, between, um, from the set one to two N, 
will use gamma sub s to denote the products of Majoranas with indices in s in increasing order. And um, so there's two to the 2n of these products, and they form a basis for the space of n qubit operators. One way to kind of see this is that under the jordan wigner transformation, each product of Majoranas maps to a different Pali string, and we know that Pali strings span the space. Okay, so now for any match state circuit U, if we conjugate um, a Majorana operator by U, then we get a linear combination of Majoranas, where the coefficients in this linear combination are given by some orthogonal matrix. So because uh, products of Majoranas span the whole space, this equation uniquely specifies the match state circuit up to a global phase that we don't care about. So you can see that each match state circuit is uniquely specified by an orthogonal matrix Q. Um, so we'll add a Q as a subscript to U to reflect this. And for a bit more notation, we're also going to use script U sub Q to denote the quantum channel that conjugates by U sub Q. OK, so now we can go through our checklist uh, for D to take in to be the uniform distribution of match state circuits. The first thing to check is that we can efficiently implement this distribution. And this is actually quite standard, so I won't go into this um, in too much detail. The bottom line is that we can efficiently sample unitaries, a uniformly random match state circuit, um, and compile it into a circuit consisting of at most n squared, one and two qubit Pali rotations, um, and these can be parallelized to linear depth. So now for the more uh, non-trivial -triv parts. Um, the first step is to determine the measurement channel M. So we had this expression for M from a previous slide, and we can massage it um, in such a way as to separate out the dependence on the distribution D. So here we see that M depends on the distribution D that we choose only through its twofold twirl channel, like the average over D of two copies of the unitary channels. And we'll call this twofold twirl E2. Um, so when D is the uniform distribution of our match state circuits, remember that there's a one to one correspondence between match state circuits and orthogonal matrices. So we can write E2 as a Haar integral over the orthogonal group. So now, how do we evaluate this? Well, um, a first easy thing to observe is that E2 is an orthogonal projector. You can either see this from direct calculation or from the fact that um, match state circuits are actually like an adjoint representation of the orthogonal group. So because it's a projector, that means that we can fully determine it by determining its image, the subspace of operators that it projects onto. And we'll do this by using symmetries of the match state group. More specifically, it turns out that by picking out certain permutations and diagonal reflections from the orthogonal group, and considering how their corresponding match state circuits conjugate the Majorana operators, we can actually fully determine E2. And we're going to come back to this a bit later. But for now, once we have our explicit expression for E2, we just plug it back in to the expression for the measurement channel, and we get that our measurement channel M looks like this. So it's a linear combination of projectors P sub 2L, where P sub 2L projects onto the subspace spanned by all products of 2L Majorana operators. So from this, you can see that the measurement channel M is not actually invertible, on the full space of operators because it doesn't map onto any product of an odd number of Majoranas. But it is invertible on the subspace of even uh, products. And this turns out to be sufficient for our purposes, essentially because physical fermionic observables are generally in the even subspace. OK, so now that we've determined our measurements channel, um, we now need to think about how to efficiently compute the expectation values that we want with respect to our match state shadows, so this quantity here. So we have our expression for M inverse. It was this linear combination of projectors. We plug it in, 
And we get that our unbiased estimates for, for the expectation values of any observable looks like this. So a natural thing to try to do is to just evaluate each, um, each of these trace terms in this linear combination separately and then add them all together. But the question is, can we efficiently do this? Because the first thing that looks potentially problematic is these projectors P sub 2L. The naive way to apply these projectors would be to expand everything out in the, in the basis of products of Majorana's, um, but this involves dealing with exponentially many terms in general. So our workarounds for this is essentially to find a generating function. Um, in other words, we are gonna encode all of these trace terms that we want as the coefficient of a certain polynomial. And this is what this polynomial looks like. It might not be immediately obvious why this is true, um, but we can at least do a quick sanity check. So uh, we can see that this polynomial P of Z depends on the computational basis state that we measured. So B through these signs minus one to the B sub J. It also depends on the particular match date circuit, UQ, that we sampled through these gamma tildes here. So the gamma tildes are just what you get by conjugating our original Majoranas um, by U sub Q. So this kind of gives you a new basis of Majoranas that we get from rotating the original ones. And so the nice thing about this polynomial is that it doesn't explicitly evolve, involve the projector um, P sub 2L. So we've at least made our lives easier from sort of an aesthetic point of view. But of course, we're not finished because now the big question is, how do we efficiently evaluate this polynomial? And this is where we have to start thinking about specific observables O. So in the paper, um, I take two approaches. The first approach involves directly working uh, with the Clifford algebra generated by the Majorana operators. And this allows us to derive efficiently computable expressions for the polynomial P of Z for various broad classes of observables. So one such class um, is products of Majoranas in any basis, like any basis that you get from conjugating by, um, by a match date circuit. And the expectation values of these observables allow us to estimate KRDMs, for instance, or arbitrary local observables. Another case we can handle is where the observable is the density operator of any fermionic Gaussian state. So fermionic Gaussian states are eigenstates um, or thermal states of, of free fermion Hamiltonians. And the expectation values of these allow us to estimate, for instance, fidelities between our unknown state rho and arbitrary pure Gaussian or arbitrary Gaussian states. Um, and another case we can handle is where the observable is of the form cat phi bra zero, where phi is any slated determinant, which is just a Gaussian state of fixed particle number. And the expectation values of these um, give us the overlaps that we want for QCQMC. So just to illustrate a bit more explicitly, for this case, uh, we prove that the polynomial P of Z can be expressed as the Fafian of a certain linear matrix function, where here M1 and M2 are matrices that are MO size N, um, and they're efficiently computable from our inputs. So then this Fafian, you can compute in polynomial time. Okay, so the second approach um, is we develop a general procedure for efficiently evaluating the trace of any products of operators, where each operator in the product is either a linear combination of Majoranas or the density operator of any Gaussian state or any Gaussian unitary, or equivalently a match state circuit. So, for instance, uh, you could use this method to efficiently evaluate a quantity like this if you wanted to, for whatever reason, like I have no idea why you would wanna do that, but you can. And I should emphasize that uh, this is a purely classical algorithm, so it might be useful in classical simulation as well. But a more concrete application is that we can use it to evaluate a quantity of this form. 
And this allows us to actually estimate overlaps with arbitrary pure Gaussian states using our match gate shadows. So not just later determinants, which are a special case of pure Gaussian states. And I won't have time to get into this, but at a very, very high level, the second approach um, entails sort of recasting our problem in terms of um, a higher dimensional Grassmann algebra that's related to the Clifford algebra generated by our Majoranas. Okay, so we can efficiently post-process our match gate shadows to estimate various quantities, including the overlaps that we need for QCPMC. But we still have to make sure that the variances aren't too large so that we don't need too many samples. Now, recall that um, I, show, I claim that the measurements channel M depends on, depends on the unitary distribution D that we choose only through its two-fold twirl channel. Similarly, it turns out that the variance for any observable only depends on D through its three-fold twirl channel E3. So we want to evaluate E3 for our uniform distribution over matched state circuits. How do we do this? Well, just like for E2, remember I claimed that we were able to fully evaluate E2 um, just by picking out certain permutations and diagonal reflections and considering their action on Majoranas. Similarly, it turns out that we can also fully evaluate E3, again, just by considering the action of permutations and diagonal reflections. But this is rather interesting because permutations and diagonal reflections don't generate the full orthogonal group, right? They only generate the discrete subgroup of the orthogonal group that consists of signed permutations. So the fact that we can evaluate E3 by only thinking about these permutations and reflections means that the threefold twirl channel is actually exactly the same for the ensemble of only the match state circuits that correspond to signed permutations. And these are actually just the Clifford match state circuits because these uh, permute the Majorana operators up to, up to a sign. And to remember, Majorana operators uh, map to Pallies via the jordan wigner transformation. So these are the match state circuits that uh, permute Pallies, i.e. Cliffords. So in, in T-design terms, what we've, we've essentially shown is that the discrete subgroup of the Clifford match state circuits um, forms a three design for the continuous subgroup for the continuous group of all match state circuits. Um, so colloquially, we can call the Clifford match state circuits a match state three design. And this is a rather general theorem. You can apply it in any context involving up to the third moment of uniformly random match state circuits. In the specific context of shadows, this means that we can either we can use either ensemble and get the same results, at least if we're only interested in bounding the variance. This might have practical implications. It might be easier to implement one ensemble than the other. But from a mathematical perspective, um, it's actually very useful because it allows us to use the more obvious symmetry of the full match state group to analyze its discrete subgroup. And this is sort of reminiscent of how in the original Shadows paper, the fact that Clifford's form a unitary three design was a key ingredient in analyzing the Clifford shadows. Okay, so, and we can show that the variance is small, but I won't have time to get into that. So to summarize, um, we've constructed efficient protocols for estimating several broad classes of fermionic observables. And as side results, we prove that Clifford match gate circuits form a three design for the full match gate group, which implies that we can use either ensemble for the purpose of doing these protocols. And um, this match gate three design results might also apply more generally in any other setting involving random match gate circuits. We also provide a general procedure for efficiently classically computing the trace of arbitrary products of certain types of fermionic operators. And one concrete application of this is, is that it allows us to compute expectation values of any such product using the match date shadows. Okay, so with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for listening.
Um, apologies, this may be a slightly simple question, but just um, going back to the motivation, um, you said that uh, the post-processing cost was exponential, mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't quite catch why, because I was just thinking that inverting uh, the, the channel on a computational basis state with Clifford circuits should be classically efficient. So if you look at the expression that we want to compute um, to get the unbiased estimate for expectation values, it looks like this. And for uh, QCQMC, we want to compute overlaps with arbitrary Slater determinants. So you have, you're going to have some like phi, which is a Slater determinant, um, this stuff sandwiched with zero. And when you have a Clifford circuit, when you have just the general Clifford circuit, U, it's not clear how you would compute like the overlap between even starting in a basis state having a Clifford circuit and then ending in a Slater determinant. So is that to say that it could map the Slater determinant to a linear combination of an arbitrary number of Slater determinants? Yes, because you, um, like the Slater determinants form a continuous manifold. Whereas, you know, you can only do, you can only simulate Clifford circuits when you start and end in a stable, in a stabilizer state. That makes sense, thank you. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I just want to, uh, so when you talk about these uh, formulas, right, for computing these uh, observables, uh, are you using the VIX theorem or, or is there something extra? Uh, yeah, just want, yeah. Is not general enough in order to, to get the expressions that we want. Um, but you can actually derive Witt's theorem by thinking in terms of the Clifford algebra. And that's sort of how I came up with this, like looking at the proof of Witt's theorem and trying to extend it. Uh, iPad here for questions. All right, with that, um, can we thank the speaker again?